everybody just uh, close your eyes please everybody thank you it is 6 p.m i'm in the middle of the water there's water everywhere i'm freezing cold i'm thinking about my mother i want to go home but i'm in a boat with 20 people and a child my sister is 17 years old and she's with me. I don't know what to do. If she dies, I would never ever live with that guilt ever again. What should I do? Okay, then we have to jump. We decided to jump. But before I continue the boat, you can open your eyes. Let me take you back to 2015, to Damascus. Hello. I was born and raised in Damascus city, Syria, where mosque and church raised their voices together. The land of working women and men equally. The land when the smile comes before introduction and shaking the hand. The land that doesn't matter if you're called Sarah, or Omar, or Khalil, or Roger, or anything. The land that doesn't matter what kind of skin color you have, or what background, or what ethnic group you come from. This is my homeland. As everybody know, in 2010, it was the rise of Arab Spring. And how everybody knows as well, there is no victory without sacrifice. Everybody had their own sacrifice in the war. My sacrifice and my family's sacrifice was losing our family house in 2012. And my second sacrifice is I had to leave for my own safety, to continue my own education. In 2015, August, I was asked my, by my parents, especially my mother, she came up to me with a backpack, like any backpack you take to school. And she said, pack whatever you want to take because you're leaving. You're going away from home. I want you to take five seconds and imagine with me as a 20 years old girl asking her to pack 20 years of her life in a backpack. What would you take? Imagine with yourself for a second. 20 years of my life, which I think most of you here, around 20s, 22, 24, maybe, even maybe more, but still. Do you want to know my answer? I took nothing. I left all my past behind me because I cannot choose which memory I want to take. And I just left. August 2015, I end up on a crowded plastic dinghy with 20 people, with my 17 years old sister, 20 people on a boat, three of them as women, and one four years old child. We, continued, we started a journey like everyone else, like how you see it in the news, if you watch the news. Just floated dinghy that we use for a vacation when we go with our parents, which is basically, I don't think it's bigger than this space. I think this, the sign itself is bigger than the boat. Um, after 15 minutes, when we left the shoreline, the engine stopped and the water stopped sinking, start sinking, start getting in the boat, sorry. And after that, a man stand up and said, why don't we jump in the water, make it heavy from the sides and lights from the inside so we can survive. You have no time, no time to think. You need to act directly. What we've done, he jumped in the water. I stood up, I'm a lifeguard, I'm a professional swimmer since I was seven years old. Of course I'm not gonna be sitting in the boat when there's people actually drowning. I jumped in the water, a couple minutes later, my sister jumped as well. We continued like this for three and a half hours. We made it safely to the shoreline of Lesbos. <clears throat> and then we said, yay, we made it to Europe. 
and we didn't know it was just the beginning. We end up sleeping the night in a church, and then in the morning, we've been picked up by an organization, I actually don't remember the name, and they took us to a Mytilene port, which if you're watching the news right now, you absolutely know what I'm talking about. Um, in Mytilene port, they took us with a ferry to Athens, and then from Athens to Macedonia, and then from Macedonia to Serbia, Serbia to Hungary, Hungary to Vienna, Austria, Vienna, Austria to Munich, Germany, and then Berlin. We stayed in a refugee camp for eight months. After that, we found a swimming club. My sister continues swimming, and I discovered that I have a permanent injury. I cannot be a professional swimmer anymore. I had to find a way to survive. I lost the only dream that I left my home for, which is to be a, an Olympic swimmer, which is okay. Now I'm fine. But I discovered I had so much other powers that I could use, which is my voice and my body and my skills. I volunteered in an organization in Berlin for a couple months because I speak fluent English and Arabic, and of course, if I can just move my mouth and help others, why not? Then my boss discovered that I have an ability to do a good job in public speaking, so she asked me to go for the first public speaking event for me was in Strasbourg, was the I event. I spoke my story for the first time and I ended up crying at the end of the speech because it was the first time I hear myself speaking, my story. Or was it easy? After that, I got a Facebook message from a volunteer asking me to come to Lesbos and volunteer for a couple, month, a couple weeks, actually, and meet the team and meet the refugees because the refugees was coming up to him and for the other volunteers and asking them to teach them swimming to become like the Mardini sisters. I'm sure a lot of you heard about the Mardini sisters story, the boat story, it was all over the news. After he texted me, I directly, went, I directly went to Lesbos and then in Lesbos I tried to understand why these kids want to be me. So apparently that team used to do swimming classes for the kids and the therapist of the refugee camp used the Sara and Yusra Mardini story to make the kids maybe feel hope again that the water is not your enemy, something else is your enemy, and there is future if you just look at the end of the tunnel. I met the kids, and then my two weeks turned into two and a half years of uh, volunteering and advocacy work on the Lesbos, Greek Lesbos Island. And as a, um, a wording for my two and a half years of volunteering, I was detained for three and a half months with the following crimes. Belonging to a criminal organization, money laundering, espionage, smuggling, trafficking, and fraud. All that because I was standing on the shoreline, handing over water and blankets and translating. Do you think this is a crime? You can knock your head. Do you think this is a crime? Did you know that uh, there is something called criminalizing humanitarians happening maybe a couple of kilometers away from here? No one knew. So this is what the humanitarians are going through right now. And something else. My talk today is called border stock because the EU unfortunately succeed with building more high borders than actually accepting more people. And I have a little question here. So how many of you, I need hands, I want to see hands. How many of you think that I'm here today to tell you how you can help refugees? No one believes that I'm here to tell you how to help refugees? Good, to be honest, I'm happy to hear that because I'm not here to tell you how to help refugees. I'm actually here to tell you what we've done wrong. We're sitting and doing nothing. That's what we're doing. We're just electing people. What's going on right now, it's made by us. Whenever there's elections in the EU, in the US, anywhere, even in Syria, we all think that we voted <clears throat> and that's enough. And even there's some of you in now within themselves saying, I don't have the right to vote, so she's not talking about me. Which is honestly, I also do not have the right to vote, but I also made a mistake by not talking about it. I have a voice. 
I could have talked to my friends, talked to my neighbors, talked to my teachers, professors, everybody, and told them, make sure you make the right decision when you vote. Because we are the people who's putting these people in power. Am I right? We are the people who's voting to make politicians get the power. And by making them take the power, they're just spreading their evil energy upon us. You just said yourself, you don't know that there's something called criminalizing humanitarians. There's 150 cases around the world for people your age and older. Use Google, people. We are suffering. And right now, while I'm talking to you, on the borders between Turkey and Greece, there's people getting stripped, beaten up, and dying from the violence that is happening. Turkey broke the EU-Turkey deal and pushed all the refugees to Greece, and Greece closed the borders. And there's 80,000 people, while I'm talking right now to you, stuck in the cold. They don't even have a tent or a blanket or a bathroom or food or water. So if I, you want to get one thing from me today, when you go home, use the screen that you use it for WhatsApp, music, YouTube, anything, to research these things. Because we are the future. And we have the voice. As I am here today, I'm nothing without everybody of, every one of you. So when you leave this door today, first thing you're going to do, search Greece, Turkey. If you don't want to go out on the streets, you don't want to go to, there, to Greece or Turkey to help, there is petitions everywhere. It takes you five seconds to sign a petition. And don't tell me it's not going to come to you. It's not going to affect you. I said that myself. I lost everything. It's a couple kilometers away from our home doors. And we need to do something right now. Because that's going to be our future. Do you want to live in a world that we're just fighting for justice and we're studying about it in universities, but then when it's come to human being in front of you, we don't even know what we've been going through as a humanitarian. So that was my message for today. And I hope, I hope, I see one of you standing up in panels, creating your own campaigns, creating your own petitions, because people and the other side of the world, a couple kilometers away from us need us. And we cannot do that by ourselves. Thank you.